Well, good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening. Whenever you're watching this worship video, we are so grateful that you're choosing to spend some day of your day with us here at Brighton United Methodist Church, worshiping God together. We're so excited to be gathered, and welcome to this edition of the Virtual Worship for July 18th, 2021. How did we make it over halfway through July already? The summer is blazing by, but the Lord who guides our steps continues to move and, uh, and grow our ministry as we emerge from COVID. <clears throat> and that means we want you to remain connected with us throughout all of that movement as we, uh, as we continue adding new aspects back into our ministries and, and leaning into what God has for our future together. And that begins by sending you over to our website at brightonunitedmethodistchurch.com. There you can find all the information about our ministries, things that are new, things that are returning, things that are continuing, and you can uh, get connected with us and make sure that you're uh, plugging into our ministries and being a part of, of life here at the church. Now, we also want to send you over to our Facebook page uh, where you can plug into the midday prayer break Monday through Friday at noon. Supercharge that prayer life with us. You can also look under events and get all of the updated information about upcoming events, including the continuation of our virtual Bible study, which meets Tuesday mornings at 9 a.m. on Zoom. You can get, in fact, all of the information and, of course, the inspiration that you need to get through your week with God and with us here at Brighton United Methodist Church. Now, as we transition into the atmosphere of worship, as we come into the presence of God together, we are invited there through the words of Psalm 89. We'll read verses 20 to 37. I have found my servant David. With my holy oil I have anointed him. My hand shall always remain with him. My arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him. The wicked shall not humble him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down those who hate him. My faithfulness and steadfast love shall be with him. And in my name, his horn shall be exalted. I will set his hands on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. He shall cry to me, you are my father, my rock and the rock of my salvation. I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. Forever I will keep my steadfast love for him, and my covenant with him will stand firm. I will establish his line forever, and his throne as long as the heavens endure. If his children forsake my law, and do not walk according to my ordinances, if they violate my statutes, and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the rod." and their iniquity with scourges. But I will not remove from him my steadfast love or be false to my faithfulness. I will not violate my covenant or alter the word that went forth from my lips. Once and for all I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His line shall continue forever and his throne endure before me like the sun. It shall be established forever like the moon, an enduring witness in the skies. Friends, you and I, we are sons and daughters, heirs with Christ. We, we are the continuation of the promise we heard in the psalm, the promise we will hear in our scripture today, the promise of God to be with us, that we would be God's people he would be our God, as he says, he is faithful, that we shall endure. Let us humble ourselves before the God who is faithful. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, you are faithful and your promises are mighty. We are humbled in your presence and long to feel the swift and life-giving breath of your Holy Spirit. Lord, pour that Spirit upon us as we worship you today. May it come into our hearts that they might be strangely warmed. May it come into our minds that we might be truly inspired. Lord, take hold of our lives and transform us to your glory. Today and forevermore we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.
We begin our time in prayer with a prayer of confession. This is where we invite the Holy Spirit into our lives to reveal for us any way that we are sinning and falling short of God's glory. When we feel that conviction of the Holy Spirit, we confess our sins to God. Then we turn from our sins, repenting and taking hold of the power the Holy Spirit gives to overcome our sin. Then we discover the miracle of the gospel, which is that God is more ready, willing, and able to forgive our sins far more than we ever are to confess or repent. So friends, will you join me now in our prayer of confession? O oh, holy and merciful God, we confess that we have not always taken upon ourselves with joy the yoke of obedience, nor been willing to seek and to do your perfect will. We have not loved you with all our heart and mind and soul and strength, neither have we loved our neighbors as ourselves. You have called us to the need of our fellows, and we have passed unheeding on our way. In the pride of our hearts and our unwillingness to repent, we have turned away from the cross of Christ and have grieved your Holy Spirit. The Lord is mighty to save and faithful to forgive. So may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins through Jesus Christ our Lord, and strengthen us to live in the power of the Holy Spirit all our days. Amen. And now, friends, having embraced afresh the forgiveness of God in Christ Jesus our Lord, we now turn in body and soul, voice and mind to declaring our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Would you join me? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and of earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we continue our time in prayer together, we want to invite you, if you have a joy or a concern to share with us, your church family, take advantage of our prayer email address. Send in those joys and concerns to brightonumcprayers at gmail.com. When you do, those prayer requests come directly to me. And when they come in, I lift them up in prayer, and then I send them along to our prayer warriors that we might keep you in prayer throughout the week. Allow us the privilege of praying with you and praying for you. Together we will contend for your breakthrough in the mighty name of Jesus. And if you would like to join our team of prayer warriors and receive those emails and lift others in prayer, we want to invite you to uh, go to our website at brightonunitedmethodistchurch.com. Scroll down a little bit to the link where you can go to MailChimp and sign up to receive those prayer warrior email updates and join us in lifting each other up in prayer. And now, friends, may we gather our hearts and minds together in silent prayer, 
preparing to become before the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we come before you from the busyness of life, longing for your direction, longing for your aid in sorting through and prioritizing all that comes before us. Lord, there is family and work. There is chores and duties. There is joy and fun. There is everything in between, O oh God. And it seems like we can be torn in many different directions. But Lord, we humble ourselves before you in prayer, longing to go in your direction, wanting to go where your Holy Spirit would guide us. Lord, may we lean into your presence today, that you would make straight our way, that you would be that shining lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Lord, where we have turned and gone astray, bring us back into your fold. Where we have been faithful yet timid, give us bold hearts to act with courage, declaring your praise and sharing the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, where you have given us duty, help us to respond in faith, knowing that you empower us to meet any call you place on our hearts. Lord, as much as we like to be in charge, we know deep down that you, you are the one who needs to be captain of our lives. So, Lord, we relinquish control as hard as it is and give it to you, trusting in your faithfulness, your loving kindness toward your people. Lord, hear our prayers, those that have escaped our lips and those that live deep within our souls, for we entrust them to you in the mighty and the powerful and the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior the one who taught us how to live, the one who shows us how to love, and the one who brings us together in prayer as we now join in saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Today's scripture is 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 through 14. Today I will be reading out of the New Living Translation. The Lord's Covenant Promise to David. When King David was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all the surrounding enemies, the king summoned Nathan the prophet. Look, David said, I am living in a beautiful cedar palace but the ark of God is out there in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, go ahead and do whatever you have in mind for the Lord is with you. But the same night, the Lord said to Nathan, go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord has declared. Are you the one to build a house for me to live in? I have never lived in a house from the day I brought the Israelites out of Egypt until this very day. I have always moved from one place to another with a tent and a tabernacle as my dwelling. Yet no matter where I have gone with the Israelites, I have never once complained to Israel's tribe leaders, the shepherds of my people Israel. I have never asked them, why haven't you built me a beautiful cedar house? Now go and say to my servant David, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies has declared. I took you from tending sheep in the pasture and selected you to be the leader of my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone and I have destroyed all your enemies before your eyes. Now I will make your name as famous as anyone who has ever lived on the earth. I will provide a homeland for my people, Israel, planting them in a secure place where they will never be disturbed. Evil nations won't oppress them as they've done in the past, starting from the time I appointed judges to rule my people, Israel. I will give you rest from all your enemies. Furthermore, the Lord declares that he will make a house for you, a dynasty of kings. For when you die and are buried with your ancestors, I will raise up one of your descendants, your own offspring, and I will make his kingdom strong. He is the one who will build a house, a temple for my name, and I will secure his royal throne forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. If he sins, I will correct and discipline him with the rod like any father would do. The word of God for God's people. Thanks be to God. Well, grace be yours and peace from Jesus Christ, our Lord. Do you ever have a plan? You ever have a plan? Some of us never have a plan, really, but most of us do at some point in our lives develop a plan. And sometimes, in fact, many times, things don't seem to go according to plan. Am I right? How many of us have watched the National Lampoon's Vacation movies, you know, Christmas Vacation, despite their best efforts, everything devolves into chaos, right? You ever had a plan that devolved into chaos? Well, David had a plan. David, the, the, the boy who would be anointed king, who would slay Goliath, who would play the lyre to soothe Saul's uh, disturbed mind as he's fallen away from God. This same David, the king of the Jews, the one who unites the kingdom and brings them together. David, David had a plan. David even sought the advice of one of God's prophets, Nathan. Here we have in this beautiful story today, David's plan meeting God's prophet. And so here, so here in the midst of David seeking out Nathan to collaborate on the plan, we have here this passage, both sides of a situation 
to which we can relate. On the one hand, we've all at one point or another had a plan. And on the other, we've all been like Nathan, one consulted about a plan. We've all been the person with the plan, and we've all been the person consulted about the plan. I want to begin, first of all, with the man with the plan. The man with the plan, of course, is David, King David. Now, we got to kind of know how we got here, right? We, we highlighted it a little bit. Uh, David was the, the young boy, the son of Jesse from Bethlehem, and he is anointed king by the prophet Samuel. After Saul loses God's favor for not being obedient, David then kills Goliath and plays the lyre for the king. This same David becomes a mighty warrior, a leader in the army of God, even under the king he's to replace. He has finally, in, the, in the, the battle with the Philistines that takes the life of Saul and his sons, he finds himself elevated to king, first over the southern kingdom and then uniting the kingdom north and south and establishing Jerusalem as his capital city. And as we have been reading along in David's story for some time in the, the midday prayer break during the, the daily lectionaries, we've heard of David retrieving the Ark of the Covenant and bringing it up to Jerusalem, pitching its tent and establishing God's home in the city, Jerusalem. Now once, once he has settled, as it says, uh, now, when the king was settled in his house, right, the Lord had given him rest from all of his enemies around him. Once he has settled and he's, he's brought the ark into Jerusalem, he gets an idea. The seed of a plan begins to form. I will build a temple. I will build a house to the Lord. Why should God, the one who delivered us, the one who's established me as king, the one who anoints me over the people, the one who has united us and delivered us from enemies, why is it that I am in a house of cedar, as he puts it, and God is in a tent? Now, building a temple sounds like a good idea, right? It sounds like something noble, like let's build a church building. But the truth is that David may have some selfish tendencies sort of arising here, right? As his power grows, as, as things become unified around him, he looks around at the other peoples that God has delivered them from, and he recognizes that their gods live in lavish temples, huge monuments to how significant and important their God is, and what a boon it would be for the king of the Jews David, to establish a mighty house for Yahweh, right? He wants to establish that house like other people. The real problem here with David's plan is that he honestly doesn't consult God. He doesn't consult God. As much as we read about David being a man after God's own heart, he has this great plan, but he doesn't consult God. He does, in fact, consult Nathan. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, isn't Nathan a prophet? He's described as a prophet, right? Enemies all around him. The king said to the prophet, Nathan, wouldn't it mean that he did consult God because he talked to Nathan? Well, here's the thing. While scripture reminds us that wise counsel is important, consulting your spouse or your friend or your neighbor or even your pastor, even a prophet of God, is not the same as consulting God. Think about it. When we consult other people, it's not the same as consulting God about our plans. And as it turns out, as we learn in our passage today, David's plan does not seem to be in alignment with God's heart. Hear the way, hear the way it's, it's portrayed for us in Scripture. In chapter 7, starting in verse 5, Nathan has received a word from the Lord, having already told David to go and do what's on his heart. And Nathan gets this corrective vision, and he's sent to the king. It says, go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord. What does the Lord say? Well, this would be good. We're consulting the Lord now. Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought you up 
brought up the people of Israel from Egypt on this day. But I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the peoples of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? What is God saying? God is saying to David through the prophet, so the prophet's getting an earful as well, right? Because the prophet's already greenlit this building project. David, through the prophet, is getting an earful from God about, was that ever my plan? Is that my plan or is that your plan, David? Is that my plan? Are you consulting me, the God of the universe, the God who brought you out of Egypt and established you as king? Or are you just going off doing what seems right in your own eyes? Well, this leads us to our first step in aligning our heart with God, right? Our first step in consulting God about our heart alignment. And that is our first step. Does your plan align with God's heart revealed in God's word? Because you see here in 2 Samuel, God is referring to all the time he spent from Egypt until now. Well, that would include the Torah. The whole time he's in the wilderness, all the laws and ordinances, God not only doesn't say, build me a house, he goes into great detail about the tent. And never in his time, among the time of Joshua in the conquering of the land, or the time of the judges, or any of the time under Saul, did, did God ever say, build me a house of cedar. David would just have to look back on the written word of God, revealed from God through Moses and others, to get the picture that God's heart was not for a temple. God was not going to be confined to a, to a stone building, a monument to human engineering. God was going to be free to move about with the people, to be with them wherever they would be, to be their God where they are. So the question is, does your plan, because David's plan sure didn't, does your plan align with God's heart as revealed in Scripture? That's a first step. That's a first step to consulting God. Look in Scripture. See if, and don't just see if you can find something that confirms what you want to do. Find, see if you can find something that goes against what you want to do. Wrestle with that. Pray about that. Say, God, reveal it to me in your word. Consult God's word for God's heart in a matter. Now, God goes on in his correction of David through the prophet Nathan, right? To recount his great provision, protection, and deliverance. Listen to this. He continues on in verse 8. Now, therefore, thus shall you say to my servant David. Okay, so we've got the, my will is not your will straightened out. Okay. Now say this to my servant David. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may live in their own place and be disturbed no more. And evildoers shall afflict them no more as formerly. From the time that I appointed judges over the people of Israel, God outlines for them, for David, for Nathan, just how much God has done to provide, protect, and deliver God's people. It's a reminder of what God has done, right? Here's the question, though. God is reminding David of everything that he has done for him and for God's people to challenge David. Are you building this temple? Are you building this temple for your own glory or are you doing it for mine? Is your plan designed? Here's step two, question two. Remember question one was, does your plan align with God's heart revealed in scripture? Here's step two. Is your plan designed to bring glory to you or to God? And that's sometimes a hard thing to sort out because David seems to want to give glory to God. I shouldn't be in a house of cedar if God is in a tent. 
Notice David doesn't humble himself and say, maybe I should live in a tent. No, he, he says, maybe I should build a temple to God, which, by the way, will look fantastic on my kingly resume, right? Sometimes it's hard to parse out. Sometimes it's hard to know whether your plan is designed to bring you glory or if it's designed to bring God glory. Well, after consulting God's word and being honest about our motives, then we must move on to step three. We must move on to step three, and that is receive and believe in God's promise for you. Listen to this. This is the money-making. This is the, the big one. This is the, this is the important part of this passage, so listen to this. After outlining all that he has done, God says, and I will give you rest from your enemies. We've gone from what God has done to what God will do. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house, David. Remember, Nathan is supposed to talk to David. The Lord will make you, David, a house. You, you think you're going to make a house for me? No, I'm going to turn you into a mighty house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors, that's soft Bible talk for when you die, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish your kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will punish him with the rod, such as mortals use, with blows inflicted by human beings, but I will not take my steadfast love from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Listen to that. This house that God is going to make of David, right? Shall be made sure forever before me, O God. Your throne shall be established forever in accordance with these words. And with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. Did you hear the promise? The promise to King David that you propose to build me a structure, a physical house. I'm going, to make, I'm going to make a mighty house of your name. I'm going to turn you, David, after my own heart, into a dynasty. I'm going to, I'm going to set up your sons and your daughters as king and queen. I'm going to establish your kingdom forever, and I will not withdraw my support. Here's the thing. This is an awesome promise. This is a great promise to David. This is a, a legacy kind of promise to David. It comes with accountability. And if you know anything about the way the Bible story unfolds, you know that, that those kings that follow in the line of David don't always follow after God's own heart, but God is faithful. That God uses enemies of God's people to correct with the reed, as he says. And ultimately, you and I know, you and I know that this great promise, though they are accountable, is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Is fulfilled in Jesus Christ because you see, we are sons and daughters of God, co-heirs with Christ. We are brothers and sisters of Christ, right? What did we inherit? We inherited this promise. We inherit this promise from David because Jesus is of the line of David. Jesus is the fulfillment of this promise. Not only to David, but to all of humanity through Christ Jesus our Lord. And as Paul comes to us and reminds us, great promise, even with accountability fulfilled in Jesus Christ, is the reminder that now to Him... God, who by the power at work within us, the Holy Spirit, is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we can ask or imagine. That's Ephesians 3.20. Think about that. I can ask and I can imagine a lot, but God can do far greater than you and I could ever ask or imagine. And that is the fulfillment of Christ Jesus. Greater, more than David could have ever asked or imagined a greater fulfillment than David could have imagined. Now, as I noted before, this story has both sides of this situation, right? Sometimes we are the 
ones with a plan. And sometimes we are consulted about the plan, right? Sometimes we find ourselves in consultation. Maybe it's with a spouse on a, a new job or a new life choice or a new direction or retirement. Maybe it's, maybe it's a parent as you come to them looking for guidance about what you should do with your life or where you should go with your, with your funds, whatever it might be. Whatever the plan, often we are the ones with the plan, but almost as often we are consulted in some way about a plan. And for that, we have Nathan as our example. Actually, Nathan is our counter example. Nathan is consulted about the plan that David has. And I just love that Scripture, in God's awesome wisdom, preserves his mistake for us. Do you know what his mistake was? Nathan's mistake was that Nathan, the, the prophet of God, responds to David's request, but never consults God about his counsel. Nathan never consults God about his counsel. Did you catch it in the beginning? David comes to the prophet Nathan and says, See, now I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. And Nathan David doesn't even get the question out. Nathan said to the king, go do all that you have in mind for the Lord is with you. That seems pretty bold of Nathan having not even come to God in prayer. Whether we have a plan or are consulted by, uh, about the plan, our first stop has to be the same. Our first stop has to be the same. Okay, Whether it's your plan or someone's consulting you about their plan, our first stop has to be the same. We have to consult with God. Now, some cautions, because Nathan is a, a bit of a cautionary tale here for us. It, it all works out, but Nathan is a, Nathan's boldness in declaring, go and do, the Lord is with you. We have to proceed with some caution when we dare to give counsel. The first caution that we must, we must take into account is we must only counsel others out of our healthy relationship with God and not out of a false sense of our own authority, right? We must only counsel others out of our healthy relationship with God and not out of a false sense of our own authority, right? Someone comes to us with a question, I've got a plan, I want to do this, I want to do that. This happens to pastors all the time. When, when somebody comes to a pastor and says, yes, I'd like to pursue or, or at least I'd like to... I feel the nudge that maybe God might be calling me to ministry. Well, I've been through that process. Let me just tell you about our process. And I pull out the book of discipline and we go through the process and I share with them what they have to do and the steps that they're going to have to take, the hoops they're going to have to jump through, the education they're going to have to get. And before long, we're 10 steps down the road toward ordination before, as a counselor, I think maybe we should stop and consult God about this, right? Right? I can move in my knowledge of a situation. I can move in an expertise that I might have. Someone may be coming to you, not because you're a godly person, but because you're an expert in a field. And yet we must always temper our counsel with a healthy relationship with God. Right? We must respond out of our healthy relationship with God, which will put the brakes on us moving in our own authority. We cannot bypass consultation with God. Well, I ran it by my pastor, right? My pastor seemed to be okay with it. Did your pastor consult God? You might want to check. Are you using your pastor as a way of avoiding consulting God? Ooh, maybe. There's a word of caution there for somebody, right? So we must only counsel others out of our healthy relationship with God. The second thing is important for us to remember <clears throat> We must be cautious about when, when giving counsel to others with their plan, and that is we cannot wait until we are asked to cultivate that healthy relationship with God. See, this is the thing. This is the thing. Someone comes to us with a question. You say, I don't know. Let me go talk to God about that. But it's the first time you've talked to God in a week. Someone comes to you with a plan, and more often than not, we'll launch in out of our authority, not even thinking to consult God because... We haven't been consulting God in our own lives. It is so important and it is never, it's sort of like the, the last place you want to be is in a storm without your faith. You don't want to be in that storm without your faith. Because if 
You're in the storm without your faith. You're not going to develop that faith in the midst of the storm. The storm will reveal how well you've cultivated that relationship with God. And the same is true when somebody comes to us with their plan, asking for our advice. If we're immediately answering out of our earthly selves, if we're immediately answering out of our own authority, if we aren't cultivating that relationship with God way ahead of time, then our response, our advice, our counsel is not going to be God-centered. It's going to be me-centered. And the third caution. The third caution when giving counsel to someone about their plan is when we give bad advice and are corrected by God, and we can be, that's part of that developing that relationship with God, we cannot fail to repent and make things right. That is the beauty of this story from Nathan. And, and David, because David comes to Nathan, presumably looking for God's answer, right? This is what I want to do. I've noticed I live in a house of cedar. God lives in a tent. And Nathan jumps in and says, go and do what you had in mind, right? For the Lord is with you. Well, sure, the Lord is with him. That doesn't mean that he was supposed to do it. And then God corrects Nathan because Nathan has cultivated a relationship with God, even though it didn't click in that maybe he should check with God first. God still comes through his relationship and corrects Nathan and gives him a word for David, a word, a powerful word that rings throughout history, that rings right up until Jesus Christ and right into the fulfillment of that promise to David in our lives as redemption, as redempted children of God. It's a powerful word that he receives and, and it says in verse 17, in accordance with all these words and with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. So often when we get it wrong, we're like, well, I'm just going to shrink off into the background. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to honor my relationship with God and the correction that I've received by actually admitting to the person I've counseled that my counsel was wrong. I gave bad advice. I should have leaned into God because let me tell you, that will be a more powerful witness. That will be a more powerful witness because now David knows it's not just about consulting Nathan. It's about trusting that Nathan is in consultation with God. And that Nathan won't put being right above being with God. Because let's face it, the man of God said, go and do it. And God said, wait, hold up, pump the brakes that's not my plan. And Nathan has to go back and say, yeah, actually, you know, yesterday when I told you that was God's plan, it, it turns out it's not God's plan, right? We have to have humility. Humility enough to follow God even when it makes us look like we don't know what we're doing, like we're wrong, like we might not be trustworthy, but God is trustworthy. Ultimately, our best plan will always begin with discipleship, you see. Our best plan will always begin with discipleship. That's why we do the Thirsty 30. It's not just to give you busy work to keep you feeling holy throughout the week. It's truly to cultivate that relationship with God. When we come to God in God's word, when we come to God on our knees in prayer, when we come to God in worship, it helps to break the chains of our own selfishness. It helps to, to set us free to hear the word of God as Nathan does. It, it cultivates that relationship with God so that we can move with God and not against him with every plan. Everything flows from our relationship with God through Christ, you see. If we keep our eyes on the Lord, God truly can, by the power at work within us, accomplish abundantly far more than we can ever ask or imagine. Our best plan will always be God's plan. So let's Go make God our plan. Amen. Are you ready for that homework? I hope you are. I hope you're inspired to dig deep into that discipleship. This is about the Thirsty 30, right? Practically applying what we've been talking about in our, script, our message today to your everyday lives with at least beginning the Thirsty 30. This is about cultivating that discipleship we were talking about. That's 10 minutes of Bible reading, 10 minutes of prayer, 10 minutes of worship, 30 minutes to God each and every day. If you're not doing any of that, hear me now. Pick one and do it for 10 minutes each day this week. 
If you've been doing some of it, maybe you've even flirted with 30, perhaps you've even been there a few times, but consistency has been an issue. Let's fix that, okay? Make a plan, get your plan, take it to God, get it done. 30 minutes each and every day this week. Now, if you've been doing 30 for a while, good on you, but here, hear my challenge. Give a little bit more. You will never regret giving more of your day to the God who gives us every day, amen? Now, while you're in the midst of that thirsty 30, I want you to think about your plans. And I want you to think about those times where you have counseled someone else about their plan. How have you operated out of your relationship with God? And where have you failed? Okay, think about some plan you've had or some counsel you've given about another's plan. And think about where you have, where you have, uh, operated out of your relationship with God and where you have failed to do so. And then I want you to remember you're in good company. David, the man after God's own heart, needed this lesson. Nathan, the prophet of God, needed this lesson. You and I, all children of God, need this lesson. So remember you're in good company. Repent and make it right. Okay, let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we come to you with our plans and we repent of all of those times we planned apart from our relationship with you. Lord, guide our steps, order our lives into your calling to be your people. Lord, may we find your will in the pages of scripture. May we sense your way in the presence of the Holy Spirit. May we counsel one another into greater and greater honor and glory to you, O God. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Just as God reminds David of his provision for his young king, so too we are reminded as we come to this time of offering that God has provided us with marvelous provision, that God has entrusted to us, in fact, everything that we have and calls upon us to give generously to the ministries of his church. Now, God calls upon us to give, not because God has need of our money, but because God knows that giving is a need for our spirits, that our faith grows as we trust God and entrust our riches to the church, that it might be a blessing to the world. Cultivating that generosity in us is a step toward God and God's purposes for our lives. And so if you would like to take that step, if you would like to uh, give us a donation, support the ministries of God here at Brighton United Methodist Church, we want to welcome you to do that in a couple of ways. First of all, you can send your, uh, your donation here to the church. We do, in fact, still get the mail. You can log on to our website at brightonunitedmethodistchurch.com forward slash donate and make your donation there. Or you can set it up with your financial institution to send us your contribution automatically. However you do it, we want to thank you for your generosity and give glory to God for all of his marvelous provision to our ministries together. Now, perhaps you find yourself in the midst of a hard time. Maybe you've lost your job. Maybe your hours have been cut. Maybe you've just find yourself in the midst of one of life's big messes and you could use a hand. Reach out to us at uh, our prayer email address, brightonumcprayers at gmail.com. When you send in your need there, we will do our best to respond. Don't let shame or pride or embarrassment get in your way of asking for the help you need. We, your church family, want to be here for you in this time of trial. And now, friends, let us give to the Lord generously. Gracious and loving God, you entrust us with all that we have. 
And we, in turn, entrust your church with these our gifts. Bless them that they might go out into the world sharing your good news, building your kingdom, shedding abroad love in the hearts of all who believe. Bless these gifts to your work in this world, we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. we go from the worship of this time together to the worship of our everyday lives, may you go as sons and daughters of the living God. May you go with the blessing of David. May you go to seek the counsel of God and to seek after God's own heart. And as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.